The revelation that private conversations of UN Secretary General Kofi Annan were recorded by either the British or the Americans in the lead up to the Iraq war has sparked outrage from some and a philosophical shrug from others. Few may object to the monitoring of criminals or terrorists, but how widespread has illegal surveillance of individuals like Kofi Annan become? And what role does Australia play? In a moment, we'll be putting these questions to a US intelligence expert, but first this background report from Irene Ullman. How are you feeling? Good morning. Good morning. Early 2003 was crunch time in the United Nations Security Council. The US desperately wanted a resolution which would make it legal for it to go to war with Iraq. With stiff resistance from members of the Security Council, any leverage was an advantage. In London, an email was leaked in which the US National Security Agency was asking British intelligence to spy on members of the Security Council. Catherine Gunn from the British Government Communications Headquarters blew the whistle. Well, the UN was being undermined in an unlawful way in order to achieve um, war, which is going to cost lives. I think those two things add up to um, something which most people uh, wouldn't agree with. After eight months of facing charges for breaching the Official Secrets Act, Catherine Gunn is free, the evidence apparently far too sensitive to be heard in court. But then came another bombshell from Claire Short, a former member of Tony Blair's cabinet. She claimed that UN Secretary General Kofi Annan's conversations had been bugged and that she had seen the transcripts herself. I've seen transcripts of... Uh Kofi Annan's conversations. In fact, I've had conversations with Kofi in the run-up to war thinking, oh dear, there will be a transcript of this and people will see what he and I are saying. And, and it, so, so in other words, uh, British spies, let's be very clear about this case in case I'm misunderstanding you, British spies have been instructed to carry out operations within the United Nations on people like Kofi Annan. Yes, absolutely. Did you know about this when you were in government? Absolutely, I read some of the transcripts of the accounts of his conversations. Is this legal? I don't know, I presume so. The Vienna Convention as part In fact, of bugging the UN is illegal. It violates the 1961 Vienna Convention. But that doesn't make it any less widespread. As conventions oh, it's extremely widespread. Professor Desmond Ball, a world authority on intelligence, says that even though bugging is a widespread phenomenon, allegations that the UN was bugged caused outrage, for good reason. One, one is simply uh, hypocrisy. Uh, the governments and the countries that engage in this operation uh, have all signed legal agreements to the effect that they uh, do not intercept uh, anyone else's diplomatic communications. But I think there are also uh, ethical questions uh, about the bugging of uh, the United Nations and about the bugging of uh, uh, one's own allies. Australia has a key role in sharing and providing intelligence to its partners via the US-Australia Joint Facility at Pine Gap and another facility at Geraldton, which is run by Australia's Defence Signals Directorate. DSD monitors all international telephone conversations, faxes and email traffic which go through communication satellites stationed in Southeast Asia and the Southwest Pacific. But our government won't comment on what it knows of the UN bugging operation. So does that mean we're never going to know whether Australia and its allies have broken the law in this matter and by illegally recording Well, we, we definitely uh, don't break the, the laws of Australia in intelligence operations. But Professor Ball says illegal activities are part and parcel of intelligence operations. Uh, yes, we, we all have whole intelligence collection agencies who, according to the strict, strict definition of the law, are involved in illegal activities. We have a secret service uh, whose job in fact is to uh, break other countries' laws in terms of collecting information from the citizens of uh, other countries. Des Ball says there's no question that Australia was fully briefed on the operation to spy on the UN. We would have been apprised of uh, the, uh, the progress of this operation and we certainly would have shared the product in other words, we would have seen the transcripts of the uh, communications intercepts. Uh, 
We'll have an inquiry, Mr Speaker. Following this week's release of the report on Australia's intelligence services, there are calls for a full review of the way government uses intelligence. Three years ago, Professor Ball called for a judicial inquiry into claims that defence satellites were used to intercept calls from the Tampa carrying 400 asylum seekers and that the information was used to formulate the government's response to the situation. He now warns that there is a growing number of Australian citizens being monitored by our spy agencies. Those uh, uh, activities are certainly illegal, not just in international law, but also uh, according to uh, Australian law. We are supposed to have uh, safeguards that uh, prevent this sort of uh, monitoring of our own uh, domestic communications, communications involving uh, Australian citizens. But it's been uh, quite clear uh, that this sort of activity has been on, on the rise. James Bamford is the author of two of the most revealing books about America's most secretive intelligence agency, the NSA. He was a specialist producer of intelligence investigations for the American ABC TV network for almost a decade, and he's currently a visiting professor at the University of California. I spoke with him from Washington. James Bamford, uh, thanks for joining us. It may be against international law to bug a figure like uh, Kofi Annan or members of the Security Council, but is it against uh, British or American law? Well, it's not against American law because uh, the American law is, uh, uh, has a thing called the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, and it protects everybody in the United States with one exception, and that's uh, people who hold diplomatic immunity, diplomats. So. Uh, diplomats, uh, in terms of eavesdropping, are a fair game in the United States, and it's the same way in Britain. This has been going on for uh, uh, over 50 years, and uh, ever since the, the UN was first formed, the uh, NSA has been focusing heavily on members uh, of the UN, members of the Security Council, and uh, they're very interested in, in finding out what the, the members are doing. So tapping their home phones or tapping their uh, embassy phones is been part of the business for, for many years. Well, as, uh, apart from uh, perhaps the embarrassment of, uh, of this issue, there are no uh, consequences for any agencies or agents involved in this uh, activity. Uh, this hardly ever comes to uh, public attention because uh, many of the countries that are involved uh, do their own spying and the last thing they want is for this to come out. France spies a great deal, Russia used to spy a, a great deal, the United States the UK uh, uh, members of the Security Council spend a lot of time spying on each other. So um, none of those countries want the, uh, uh, the issue brought uh, to the forefront because then there'll be a question about what spying they're doing, what they're doing. Well, as you, uh, as you say, phone tapping uh, has been with us for a long time. But what's different now? Uh, technically speaking, what processes would be used to, to tap someone like a, a Kofi Annan or another individual? Well, there's a number of ways that they could uh, eavesdrop on his communications. Um, all the U United Nations uh, telephone uh, uh, lines basically go through a, a New York City telephone company, and the U.S. can easily just put taps on the um, telephone company's hard lines, basically. So any call going through the uh, telephone system from the U.N. would be tapped by the United States. And... Uh, there's really no legal problem in doing that because uh, these are diplomats and they don't have uh, immunity from the eavesdropping laws. So um, that's one way. Another way is by using the National Security Agency, which uh, does basically wholesale eavesdropping. It doesn't e eavesdrop on individual telephones, but it listens to the entire stream of communications uh, coming down from a satellite, for example. And the way it works is uh, communication satellites transmit this information down to a a ground station in the United States, for example, and the same way in Britain. And uh, once that signal comes down, uh, carrying millions of telephone calls, NSA intercepts it and then filters it through a massive computer. And that computer is programmed with telephone numbers and uh, uh, particular words. For telephone calls, they're looking for particular telephone numbers and for data communications, such as emails or uh, computer transfers they can pick out individual words. So um, they filter all this through the computers and then whatever they're interested in, a particular phone call, a particular name, or a particular word, 
will get uh, pumped out into uh, the NSA's uh, computer and it'll appear on somebody's screen or uh, in a hard copy someplace at NSA. The scale of this seems uh, mind-boggling. There must be billions of phone calls going around the world um, every week. Can they truly uh, um, you know, penetrate to that level where they can record many millions of them? Well, they do. The way it works, an average listening post, uh, for example, uh, uh, there's listening posts in uh, Australia, Pine Gap. Uh, there's one in England called Men with Hill Station. And um, the satellite communication comes down. Uh, usually it's about two million pieces of communications an hour. Most uh, of the information goes right through the computer without making any um, uh, impact. It's only when they have a particular n number for some uh, Al-Qaeda member in Afghanistan or someplace or a particular word that they're looking for. And uh, it could be the name of a... Uh, a code word that's been used or something. And then if that information comes through, that comes out. But it, it, it is about two million pieces of communications an hour for one listening post. An average is about two reports an hour uh, come from that uh, original batch of two million pieces of communications. Well, if this is a, um, a, a global uh, surveillance um, system, what role does Australia play in that, uh, in that network? Well, Australia serves as a large uh, ground station for the satellites. The satellites are up there eavesdropping on communications around the world. It eavesdrops on communications in Iraq and uh, Afghanistan, uh, Iran, all over the world. And um, these are communications that are going up to communication satellites that the NSA satellites are able to uh, pick out of the uh, ether, basically, or pick out of the sky. And then it has to transfer that information somewhere. And that's what Pine Gap is for. It sits in the central part of Australia. The original reason it was put there was because when it was eavesdropping on communications, uh, the Soviet communications, the Soviets were not able to um, uh, eavesdrop on those communications if, it was in the, if they came down in the central part of Australia. So do you suspect that Australia would be relaying all telephone calls coming from Australia, Indonesia, Malaysia, the Pacific perhaps, and relaying them directly to, uh, to NSA? Well, they won't be relaying all of them. That's, uh, the purpose of Pine Gap is to act as a, uh, one of the filters to actually go through the uh, communications and find out what is important and what isn't and get rid of the information that's not important and just forward the more important uh, signals to NSA. W what level of um, cooperation in America today is being given uh, by the telcos and the internet providers to American intelligence agencies? Are, are there statutory obligations on them? Yes, they, uh, the, uh, they've been enhanced with this new USA Patriot Act where the uh, telephone companies, the internet companies have uh, got to give this information, whatever they're asked for, to, uh, to US intelligence and, uh, and the FBI and so forth. Uh, they have to get a, a, a warrant from a, uh, a court, but it's a secret court. It's known as the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, and even its location is supposed to be secret. So nobody knows uh, who they're asking to eavesdrop on, and um, the whole procedure is kept very, very secret. So it is worrisome to a lot of people because um, there have been a lot of abuses in the past where the intelligence uh, agencies have spied uh, illegally on U.S. citizens, and especially with uh, a lot of the hysteria over uh, terrorism, uh, there's a lot of worry that they're going to go well beyond their mandate to, again, eavesdrop on um, unsuspecting uh, innocent citizens. In essence, they, uh, the legislation uh, basically mandates that these people become uh, secret agents of the government to some degree. Well, do those obligations on, on the telcos and the internet providers, do they extend to their, um, their overseas subsidiaries? Well, if, uh, if the company is not in the United States, uh, it's very difficult for the U U.S. to enforce any kind of uh, subpoena or any kind of order for them to, uh, to do this uh, if it's not physically in the United States. But the companies may do it voluntarily just to, um, uh, to help out. And again, if it's overseas, the, uh, the U.S. law doesn't apply. So um, it's very possible. Again, that's a, another area that's uh, very gray and, and very worrying to a lot of people. Right, James Bamford, uh, thanks again for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you, Mark. And that's our program for 